uh, I was sitting on the porch, I suppose like most everybody does when they go to the ocean, uh, just thanking God for all the marvelous things that he provides in your life and what a, what a wonderful creation we have. When we take a long enough time to take a look at it, it's a pretty marvelous thing. I was sitting there, one of my grandsons, uh, older grandsons, came up and sat down next to me and uh, had some theological questions, which is always good for a pastor. And uh, one of them uh, caused me to go back and explain some things to you. Um, <clears throat> He wondered about the world that was before the world. Was there an existence of real life and activity? And how would we know that before the creation of what we call the creation of the world and man? And uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> there was an absolute world of creation before the creation as we know it today. In fact, when you study the Bible, you will see that the world has, the world has changed nine times. That's a pretty amazing thing. So we're going to talk about that today and next week. Here's how this reads in Genesis 1.1. In your Bible, it probably says, in the beginning, but in the Hebrew, there's no definite article, the. So what it actually says, in a beginning. This is not the beginning, it's another beginning. All beginnings flow from God. All beginnings flow from God. Your life has beginnings. You know, you came into this world and then that was a, a beginning and then you went to school and that was a beginning and you went to high school and that was a beginning and played sports, that's probably a beginning. And then you went on and you got married and that's a beginning or went to college and that's a beginning. A lot of beginnings. The whole idea of the idea of beginning is a biblical word in a beginning. And let me tell you, every beginning in your life should be centered in God. Watch this. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Actually, it says, in a beginning, God. All beginnings are in God. All of your beginnings are in God, whether you recognize it or not. When you go to Ecclesiastes in the third chapter, he talks about appointed times in your life. And they, they deal with beginnings, different beginnings, stages of beginning in your life. What makes that beginning in your life an important feature of your life is God. In a beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. But the earth became formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And what we know that is, is the fall of Satan. God doesn't create Chaos, he's a God of order, John 14, 33. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. He is a God, or, God of order, not chaos. The author of chaos is Satan. And, the, and, and God, God is a God of order. And this, verse 2, is chaos. It's tohu wabohu in the Hebrew. Isaiah 45, 18, as we have studied, tells us that when the earth is in that condition, it's uninhabitable. And so we have a beginning in verse 1. We have another beginning. 
In verse 2, we have another beginning in verse 3, which is the restoration of creation that was in 1.1. Okay? So what we're going to look at today is this idea after a word of prayer. Let me explain to you, if you're a visitor, we thank you for coming, that if you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, it's called the gospel by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, if you believe that as the source of your salvation, you are saved. You are saved. If you believe it, you're saved. Your, your salvation is saved. It's secured and sealed unto the day of redemption, Ephesians 4.30. Now, when that occurred, you received eight works of the Holy Spirit as a token of God's grace because you belong to the new, the new covenant, the church. That indwelling of the Holy Spirit, third member of the Godhead, is essential to the Christian life. Essential. Essential to the Christian life. One of the ways it's essential is that in Bible study, the Holy Spirit will teach the Bible and recall it to your life. John 14, 26. That's very important to your life because the Bible, when it's converted to faith in your life, when you believe it, it becomes faith. When you believe it, it becomes faith. And the faith is the dynamics of the Christian life. Jesus said when you, when you hear it and believe it, it translates into truth and truth sets you free from the cosmic system of lies. God is the author of truth, and Satan is the author of lies. And he's the God of this world, with a little g, Satan is. So he can't speak the truth. He can only speak lies. God can only speak truth. His veracity is part of his character. So, in order for you to be under the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the teaching hour, you need to be sure that you have no unconfessed sin in your life. 1 John 1 9 says that if we confess our sin personal, that, that confession is personal about personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, it could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. If you're aware of that as a believer, you are to confess it in silence and privacy to the Lord. You're supposed to name it. State it. Homologeo is the word confess. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, then God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's essential for spirituality and Bible study. I take a moment. Every head bowed, every eye closed to give you privacy. If you need to deal with personal sin, deal with it by confessing it, name it, cite it. So the Holy Spirit can teach you relevant truth for your life. Stuff that will release you, will free you to serve God with a cleansed heart. Well, Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us the world in which we lived and how it has changed several times over the course of human history. A world that came out of eternity past and will go to an eternity future. And we need to understand these things to be relevant in the time of our life on earth. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me see if I can get this back up. I want to show you something. Write this at the top of your paper. Put a circle here, draw a line over, and put another circle there. This first circle represents eternity past, and the final circle, eternity future. 
you might be familiar with eternity future. It's Revelation 21-22. It's called the new heaven and the new earth. That's where this whole thing is going to wind up. But that's, that's not where, where, where it's going to wind up has a lot to do with where it started. Where it's going to wind up has a lot to do with where it started. It started in eternity past. And we're going to talk about that today. All right? There are nine times the world concept has been changed in human history. That's the first time. This is the last time. There are seven changes in between it. I'm going to talk about that next week. I'm going to talk about this first because people don't have any clue about that. What's going to change over the course of human history is the earth and the first heaven. The Bible teaches that there are three heavens. There's the third heaven where God resides, where this is eternity past. That's not changed, and it won't change over here in the last. Will not change. The third heaven is where God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit reside. When Jesus died on the cross, when he ascended back to the Father, that's where he ascended. That has never changed and will never change. It won't change over here. The changes that occur between the first and the last, these seven changes has to do with the changing of the earth and the heaven. The, so there's a first heaven. That's where God, God's throne is. That's where he resides. Jesus sits on a throne today. That's where he sits in the third heaven. The second heaven we call space. In, in human terms, we call it space. It's the universe out there. That's called the second heaven. The third heaven is the one we're interested in. That's what we might refer to as the atmosphere of the earth. The earth it re, is covered with atmosphere. We call it the sky where bird, birds and planes fly. Atmosphere. When you go out of the third atmosphere into the second atmosphere, listen, people who travel that say there's a thin line blue, a thin blue line that's obvious when you pass through it. From the atmosphere of the earth to the atmosphere of the second heaven. And listen, there would be the same experience when you pass through the second heaven to the third heaven. The third heaven will never change. It, it comes from there, a beginning. It will still be there. What is changing is this. It is amazing to me how many people don't know this. You should because it's simple Bible teaching. So what we're going to talk about is that. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about these. The new heaven and the new... Listen, when it gets over here, it's called the new heaven and the new earth, and it's referring to the atmosphere of the earth. I'm not talking about heaven. This is talking about heaven. When we're in Genesis 1-1, it's heavens. You pay attention to that stuff. So... I don't, I don't know if you can read all that because I scribble. <laughs> but I want you to know we're going to talk about this one here today. Now, listen, when a person, when a believer dies, he goes to the same place Jesus went, right? To be at 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 6, 7, and 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Where did the Lord go? He went to the third heaven. He sits on the on the seat of authority of the throne, of, of authority. And it's controlling the second half of this.
All right? Here's what Paul says. 2 Corinthians 12.2. Paul said, Paul said the same thing. Paul said, I had, I'm not sure if I had an outer body experience of being maybe like unconscious or something and had a vision of this, an awareness of what it meant to die and be with the Lord, or if I actually died and went to the Lord. But what I had in that state of mind, whether in the body or out of the body, was what he explains in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. He explains it to you. And he said, I was caught up into the third heaven. That's where God dwells. The third heaven never changes. It didn't change there. It will not change over here. Okay. When you die, if you're a believer, if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you die, you'll be absent from the body. You will be present in the Lord. And you will be with him in the third heaven until the time of the rapture when he comes back for the living believers. Okay? So we're going to talk about all this over, the ne over this week and the next week. But I, I want to... So I've entitled my lesson with you today, The Biblical View of World History. You know, everybody talks about world history, but they're, they're talking about it in a different realm. I'm talking about the biblical view. I'm looking at the bigger picture of everything, not just the snapshot window of the human life. One of the things that intrigues me and always has as a Christian is the Bible. I took a course in my seminary training that nearly caused me to give up the Bible in that, in that pit of fire. It was called textual criticism. It was the worst course I ever had in my life. It nearly destroyed my faith in the inspired accuracy of the Word of God. There is nothing else but this Bible that tells you about God that you can depend on and be trustworthy. But I had, I had great men of God around me that I could go back and say, listen, <laughs> give me some scripture that would help me believe that the Bible is the absolute word of God, that it is the eternal word of God. And let me tell you how, you won't know that unless you believe it, you don't know that. Unless you believe this is, is the eternal word of God. But listen, let me tell you what Jesus said about this, this book. Let me tell you what he said about it. I put it on the top of your paper. <clears throat> In Matthew, the 24th chapter, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, my, but my word shall not pass away. Listen, heaven and earth will pass away, and my word, the word of God, will never pass away. How important is the word of God? How important is the Bible, the word of God? You can understand why Satan would attack it. It is the eternal word of God. You know where this Bible came from? It came from there. The first world. This is where it came from. To earth. And that's where it's going back, agreed? That's where it's going back. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not. It's very important you understand that. It was passages like that that kept my head in, sh in, in order, or I'd have left. But like most college kids, I was after a degree. And I found out you don't always get accurate information by getting a degree. But, you know, you, you live and learn, don't you? Two questions I ask you today. Two questions I ask you today. How important is the eternal word of God to the biblical view of heaven and planet Earth? 
Did you know, I mean, everybody talks about global warming. And listen, that's fine. But do you know the cause of it? It's not man, unless you're talking about Adam. Global warming is the results of Adam's sin. Did you know that? Well, if you stay here long enough, I'll teach it to you where you have a biblical idea of it. Because this earth is wearing out because of Adam's sin, just like you. Do you get older? Every year you get older, Gray. Right? Older to what? You're headed to what? The grave. You know, they're not birthdays, they're death days. Well, that don't sell, does it? Yeah, well, happy death day. I don't sell. But every year you're closer to it, right? From the womb to the tomb, right? So the first question is, how important is the eternal word of God to a biblical view of heaven and planet earth? How important is that to you? Well, it ought to be. You live on the earth. I mean, how important that should that be? And people are always talking about everything. They don't know why things are happening. Everybody talks about global warming. They blame it on mankind. Well, you know, if you wouldn't chew so much gum, th this thing would go away. But it won't because it's not attached to human beings. It's attached to Adam's sin. You should read Genesis, the third chapter, 17 through 19. It will tell you that. It, it just, I don't know. Here's the second question. How important is it to the church of Jesus? How important is the eternal word of God to the church of Jesus Christ and to you as an individual believer? I mean, how often is that? I mean, this is the roadmap to your life. I mean, how often do you find yourself in a, in a maze, not figuring out how to get out of the cornfield? And the Bible will tell you how. But you never turn to it. You turn to everything in the world except the Word of God that has the absolute 100% answer to your problem. But you never open it. You don't study it. Now, I'm not talking to you. But I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people that aren't here. Right? Because you're here, and I'm thankful for that, because for some reason, God has brought you here to study the Bible with me. So I know I'm preaching to somebody who is not here and they're listening to me maybe on the internet or someplace else. But I thank you because your presence is an encouragement to me. Now here's, a, here's one, Romans 15, 4. Listen to what it says. What was written in earlier times, recorded in the Word of God, what was written in earlier times was written for our instructions. Uh, instructions about what? Life and death. I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? You live till you die. Right? And he tells you why. Listen, what was written in early times was written for our instructions. Why? Watch what he says. So that reason so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. I'll tell you, I've never seen anything in my life since COVID. I think we might have been asleep <laughs> at the wheel. COVID come, woke us all up. I have never seen in all of my years of ministry the hopelessness of people that I have seen now. COVID brought this hopelessness in people's life out of them. I see it, I see it in little children. I see it in teenagers. I see it in young adults a despair, a discouragement, anxiety, a people without hope. Let me tell you, there's nothing worse in your life 
that to feel where you are is hopeless. So I want you to write this on your paper. And if you have a Bible with you, or a cell phone, or whatever you use, there's a Bible in front of you. Just pull it out and look to Hebrews with me. You can look at the front of your Bible, and it'll give you a page number. I want you to read with me, because maybe you too know people like that, or maybe struggle with it yourself. In Hebrews, the sixth chapter, And the ladies in this church have a wonderful ministry with this concept. Their ministry, as a result of COVID, has just grown enormously. And you know the thing about COVID that I think is important? It's worldwide. It's everywhere. COVID got everybody to wake up. And when they woke up, they just felt hopeless. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in the 6th chapter, verses 18 and 19. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. That's number one. Number two, this hope. The two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie about. One, it is impossible. Say, we have been taken, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. It's set before you before it can be set in you. You have to go to the scriptures. You have to go to God. God is the author of hope as well as the scriptures. Watch this. Here's second. This hope we have, this hope we have that comes through the scriptures of the word of God, this hope we have as an anchor of our soul, an anchor of our soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, and he goes on to talk about that veil, what Jesus entered, and you enter it as well because of Christ. Because of Christ, you're in that. You, of all the people in this world that should have hope in, mo in some of the most hopeless situations is the church of Jesus Christ, the believers who sat in the church every Sunday. Because that hope has been anchored in you in Christ. And the way you know is to go to the scriptures and he'll show you why you should have hope in some of the most hopeless situations. You understand that? We need to be ambassadors of carrying the word of God to people. And let me tell you, worldwide, they feel hopeless and helpless. A person who is hopeless is helpless in his mind. It's the way he thinks. And we set on the power of change. We have the word of God. We have the message of Christ. Of all people. Listen, you should carry your Bible with you. I get more opportunities with my Bible. When I go, I carry my Bible. Some people go, I say, you get the good book. I said, what's good about it? You go, wait a minute, come back here, sir. You call that the good book. Tell me one good thing you know about it. Everybody calls it the good book and don't know what's good about it. Reading a good book. Yeah, but a good book, if it changes your life, ain't it? You ought to know what's changing your life. Not a good book because you don't read it. It's a good book when you do. The three passages I'm going to talk about today, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19, and Revelation 12. I'm going to go one, I'm going to go one through 12, if you don't mind. I'm going one instead of three. I'm going 
1 through 12. Now, I'll tell you what all three of these have in common is that first circle. You know that first circle we drew up there? And then I went across to another. I know I'm a circle guy. I know that. I, I illustrate everything with circles. I didn't realize until I met Willie, and, and I became the circle guy. Well, I, I'm back to the circles. All right? You have to pay attention to what the circle's about, though. Now, what we're going to do today in this study, we're going to study the highlights, the doctrinal point, points of highlights from each of the three passages that reveal the world that existed in eternity past before human history. A world that existed before human history. Listen, remember that Genesis, the book of Genesis, is two manuscripts. Moses wrote them in two manuscripts called Toledos. Actually, we're still in Toledoth 1. In verses one, one in, in chapter one, verse one through three, he's dealing with the first manuscript. My lesson today and next week comes out of the first manuscript. Then he begins to talk about human history, which starts in Genesis one three and goes through the rest of the book of Genesis. Eleven Toledos. Moses divided the book into two manuscripts. Yeah. Those who have been coming to the church know that. Now, I'm talking about the fall. What happened between Genesis 1 1, when God created the heavens and the earth perfectly, and all of a sudden in verse 2, we've got an earth that cannot be inhabited? Isaiah 45 18. Can't be inhabited. Tohu wabohu in the Hebrew. In the English, void, without form, and darkness. First John, write this down. First John 1 5. First John 1 9 says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness. In verse 2, we have darkness. We have darkness. And it is the darkness of Satan. Oh, you say, oh, you guys blame everything on Satan. What we blame what what was blameworthy. We don't blame them for everything. Some things we blame you about, about your own deal. But listen. Well, look, let me, let me show you a couple. Write this down. Colossians 1.13. Listen, it's not in your paper, I don't think. But Colossians 1.13. It's, I'm a, yeah, yeah, sure. Let's go ahead to it. For Listen to what, what the, he says. And he, Christ, Jesus Christ, rescues us from the domain of darkness from the domain of darkness. The domain of darkness. And transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved son. What is this domain of darkness that's in the world that we all are born into? Every member of the human race is born into the domain of darkness and has to be rescued from it by Jesus Christ. It is the domain of Satan. Watch this now. Watch this now. Let's back up to the book of Acts. Let's go back to the book of Acts. Back, back up a little bit to the book of Acts, 26, 18. It's on your paper somewhere, but you ought to write it down. In verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. Where's light come from? It's what comes from God. From darkness to light, from the domain of Satan to the domain of God. See, the domain of God is light because in God there is light. In the devil is the domain of darkness because he's the devil of darkness. And in this world, you're either in the domain of darkness or you're in the domain of light. You understand that? Everybody's born in the domain of darkness and has to be rescued and transferred out of it by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're rescued 
because you're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works. The work is done by Christ on the cross. <clears throat> not, only, not only are we turned out of darkness to light from the domain of Satan to God, but we are forgiven of our sins, and we receive an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith. Now watch this. I'll go one more place and I'll get back to my study. Ephesians. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Watch this now. Look at verse 8. Ephesians 5, 8. We'll, we'll go, I'll read a few. You were formerly darkness. Now, in interesting, he said you. You were formerly darkness. Before you got saved, you were darkness. You lived in darkness. You lived outside the realm of God. You lived in the domain of darkness. You lived in darkness. You were... All right. You were formerly darkness, but now. See the difference? Formerly and now. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. He talks about the fruit of light in verse 9. It consists of goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. That's walking in darkness. Then he comes back to the domain of darkness. He says, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Don't get engaged with the darkness that you... Don't keep going back to the old life you had without Christ. You've been rescued and transferred from that. You do ever have to do that again. And you must not. You must walk in the light. You must walk in the power of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, which is giving you power over your flesh. Galatians 5, 16, 17. Then he goes on to talk more about it. Okay? Just trying to show you, I'm trying to show you something really important. Where does the darkness that we're all born in come from? The fall of Satan. You're going to see it. It's declared in Isaiah. Before his fall, who was Satan? In this world, in eternity past, there was a world in eternity, in eternity past, who was this guy called, we call Satan? He was not called that in eternity past. He was not called Satan. Here's what he was called, though. He was called O Star of Morning and Son of Dawn. In the Latin version of the Bible, the, the, in Latin, Son of Dawn and um, Star of Morning, Star of Morning, Son of Dawn, is Lucifer in Latin. In Latin, it's called Lucifer, the Angel of Light. He was an angel of light who rebelled against God, was cast out of that eternity past world because of that, and now is known as the angel of darkness. Watch this. Let's see if I can hit this thing. I don't know if we're going to get paper or not. 2 Corinthians 11. Let me see if I can find it. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. He is going to be 2 Corinthians 11. Satan. All right. In verse 14. I'm in 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Listen to this. He, 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 in the verse prior, to it, he's talking about people who say they're in the light, but they actually do works of darkness, deeds of darkness. They say, oh, I, I belong to Christ, but when you see what, how they live and how they behave and what they teach and yada, yada, they're not. They do deeds of darkness. Now, in verse 14, he says, no wonder. No wonder people do that. 
For even, watch this now, for even Satan disguises himself. Now, Satan is the angel of what? As Satan, he's the angel of what? Darkness. In, a, in the world before human history, he was known as what? Angel of light. So he knows how to disguise himself. Come on. Right? He disguises himself as an angel of light. Did you know that? You say, I'm learning, I, I'm learning a whole lot about Satan. Now, what about Jesus? Why? He conquered him. All right. Well, all that scripture was on your paper. I didn't realize that. Satan is told by God, Satan is told by God how you have fallen from heaven. You will be cut down, cast down to earth. Isaiah 14, 12. Listen to me. Where was he when he was cast down to earth? Right? He was in the world of eternity past. Agreed? And there was an earth idea. You got that? He was cast down to earth. Did you know that? Well, I just read it. All right? That's all part of that Genesis 1-1. Look at Isaiah 14-15 on your paper. God is going to bring charges against him for rebellion against his will. He's going to bring charges against Satan for who was an archangel. Jude 9, Jude 9, he was an archangel. In, in eternity past, Satan was an archangel. Jude 9. <clears throat> and he led a rebellion of the third of the fall, a third of the elect angels against God's pl I, the plan of God revealed at the Eternal Life Conference. Because God made his son the centerpiece of it. And he went, no way, Jose. Or whatever language they spoke about God. So in Isaiah, in the passage about Satan, in Isaiah, God charges him with five wills. You should read, you should read these. I don't have time to read them all. But it boils down to spiritual arrogance. All right, you should read those. They're all recorded. You can, they'll be easy to find. I w the five I wills that stood in the way. Listen, you've got these things in your life. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do it my way. I don't care what the scriptures say. I'm going to do it my way. See, that's your will. Your will has to always be surrendered to the will of God. Jesus himself on the cross. To go to the cross which was the centerpiece of the plan of God in eternity past, he had to surrender his will to the will of God. Not by my, not by my will, but thy will be done. He hung on a cross. I mean, the very Son of God himself could do it. Satan rebelled against the very thing that Christ was credited for. He went against the will of God. He, he usurped his authority over the, over the will of God. Okay? You can read that. You, you should read these things. I, you know, you can read. Listen to Isaiah 14, 15. Nevertheless, God, God tells him why he's going to bring judgment on him. And it's because of the five I wills that stood in the plan of God against the plan of God. And here's what God says. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol. He's going to cast Satan into Sheol. This is an eternity past talk. There's a Sheol.
to the recesses of the pit that's in 2 Peter, <clears throat> Peter 2.4, that's Tartarus, that's the pit. T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S, that's the pit. In Sheol, that's the prison for angels. I'm not making this stuff up, dear hearts. I'm just reading the scriptures. To the recesses of the pit. <clears throat> From Genesis 6 through 9, yes. The fallen angels. Listen, he's going to be stuck there, right? Where's he going to put him? He's going to put him where the prison of angels that comes out of Genesis 6, 9 that caused the Noah's flood and is there. That's where he's going to stick him. You understand? It's prophetic. When's he going to do that? I know that already because I studied the Bible. During the millennial reign, at the end of the tribulation, he's going to stick him in Sheol. Well, just read the last chap three chapters of Genesis. 19, what for? 19, 20, 21, 22. Just 19 will do it. 19, 20. You should read that. So when he's going to do that. That... It, that was, the, listen to me now, it, that's prophecy declared in eternity past before human history. The Bible says it. We know it. It's going to happen in a millennium, that thousand year reign. So you just, it's just kind of interesting. I, I just find this stuff intriguing to me. Ezekiel gets a hold of this. These Isaiah and Ezekiel, of course, were great prophets on the first and second coming of Christ, uh, kind of like John was uh, in the book of Revelation. In, and <clears throat> in Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19, when we read it, we learn a few more spiritual characteristics of Satan before the fall. It's, it's really interesting when you go back in there and you take a look at this in your personal studies, you want to pay attention to who he was and what he's become. How the fall from the grace of God deteriorated his whole character. And so that was of interest to me. What was of interest to me? Who was he before? You know, when I meet people from a long period of, back of my life that are still alive, they can't believe the change, the dramatical change that came in my life. Now, not everybody has a dramatical change. I did. I really went from darkness to light. I didn't go from a dim light. <laughs> I went from a dark place <clears throat> to Christ. But, and so there, there, there is a former and there's a now, as Paul. Paul talked about formerly and now. That, that's kind of a common phrase for Paul. <clears throat> Ezekiel it gives us more information about the character of Satan called Lucifer or or. Uh, Son of Dawn, or 
uh, star of the morning. Uh, and, and so I described him because I always was interested in what he lost. What he lost in his fall. And so Ezekiel gives us more information. Uh, Isaiah didn't give us a lot, but he gave us some. But he goes on, he says, he had the seal of perfection. You, it's all in that passage. Full of wisdom, perfect beauty. Now, when God says something's perfect, it's got to be spot on, doesn't it? I mean, it's got to be spot on. <clears throat> Watch this. In Eden, the garden of God. We're talking about eternity past. We're not talking about, we're talking about eternity past. We're talking about the, the character and opportunities he had before his fall. He's described, he's described by a priestly um, jewelry or, or, or such. Precious stones for covering from the day of his creation. Priestly stones. And, and he goes, goes through a whole list of those. They are priestly. All those jewel, all those stones that you see that are described are all part of the priestly garment. He, had, he, was, he was a high-ranking, not only was, was he an archangel, but he was high-ranking in the worship program of God. <clears throat> um, he was an anointed cherubim. That's an archangel, according to Jude 9. He was allowed on the holy mountain and he walked in the midst of the stones of fire and was found blameless. In other words, he was on the, the council board of the act of the act of the plan of God. You know, like 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 in Acts 15, when you have a church a church conference, and out of that church conference comes. Uh, or, uh, ordinances of the church and things of that nature and w what we believe and what we don't and what we support and what we don't, all of that. This is that type of thing in eternity past. <clears throat> That's described in Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel 28, 11 through 15a. In Ezekiel 28, 15b through 19, the writer now talks about his fall. And 14 charges bringing divine judgment. Watch these. Now we see what, what, what happened. What was his state after the fall, after he led the rebellion against God? Right? Listen to how he's described. He's now unrighteous. Watch this now because you're involved in his trade. I mean, his trade is on earth today as a, a fireball. By the abundance of your trade, talking about his trade, you were filled with violence. The characteristic, listen, you always know where Satan is because he's pushing violence. Always about violence. You might call it crime. It's a lot of different ways to discuss this, but violence. Remember that. He, his character changed, unrighteous and violent, sinned. When you continue looking at this, God said, I will notice you're going to have numbers like one, two, three, four, because of 14 judgments. You see, the character of him after the fall. You're going to see little numbers. You see it, one, two, three, right? Now you're going to see four. Therefore I cast you profane from the mountain of God, number four, in judgment. I have destroyed you, number five, O covering, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stone of fire, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, Six, you corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. Seven, now you got to, you know what we we call that being full of yourself, <laughs> right? We call that boy, he is really full, of, and he's full of himself all the time. 
I cast you to the ground. Eight, a multitude of iniquities. Unrighteousness of your trade, you profane the sanctuary. Worship. I have brought fire to consume you and to turn you to ashes on the earth. Eleven. All who see and know you will be appalled at you. Isn't that the truth? Listen, when we know about who he really is and see him for who he is, it's appalling, isn't it? I mean, he is one bad guy. And you, Satan, watch this. This is interesting. Become terrified. Do you know who the biggest fear monger is on the earth? Do you know the guy who is more full of fear than anybody you would ever meet in the whole wide world? Satan. Because he knows what's coming. And he knows that every day gets closer to it. Satan is full of fear and if you will stay steady in your faith, you will beat him on every, ex every exercise he puts in your life. He no matter what he attacks you with, you can beat him. Because, listen, he's afraid of you. He is afraid of the church of Jesus Christ. Because that's what it's all about. Because the church represents the restrainer of evil. You know what the restrainer of evil is? The Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Satan, when he was cast down to the earth, is filled with fear. You be filled with faith and you will not have a bit of trouble with him because he's a dog that has a bark without a bite because he doesn't have teeth anymore. He's a coward. He's a coward. He's a coward. And when he fights, he fights for his life. And when you fight, you don't fight for your life because your life is in Christ. You fight for his. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You're always going to be a winner if you live for Christ. Always oh, going to be a winner. It's not based on what the world calls a winner, based on what God calls it. <clears throat> you, Satan, have become terrified and will cease to exist forever. You will cease to exist forever. You know when that'll happen? I'll tell you when. When Christ comes back. Now he's in a countdown. See, he don't know how long. The church age is going to last. Right? So what he does is fights to get it out of existence. See, he's trying to take the bite out of the church. To take the authority and the power away from the church by getting us away from the word of God. The only authority we have is to speak with the word of God with authority. In Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 10, this thing that's called ceased forever becomes reality. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are already. And they will be tormented day and night. Isn't that interesting? Tormented when? Day and night? How about that? Nobody thinks about that in heaven. Believers don't, don't, don't think about that kind of calendar. Day and night. I find that interesting. Day and night. I find that very interesting. Forever and ever. You should read... 
2015. I put it down for you to read. In Matthew 25, 41, Jesus says about his divine judgment that God declared out of, out of Isaiah and Ezekiel, Depart from me, accursed one, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. We find that Isaiah and Ezekiel wrote prophecies regarding Satan's rebellion in eternity past and his divine judgment that involved divine judgment of eternity past as well as his future attack upon messianic history. We listen. We we teach the doctrine of angelic conflict around here, right? When did that start? Right? In eternity past. Right? It's called the angelic conflict for a good reason. It was an angelic war. It will wind up that way. Michael will fight. Michael and the elect angels will fight with him again in the end. It's an angelic conflict. We fight an angelic conflict. We fight what we call the angelic conflict every day of our life. Listen, you've got to be able to see it at school, on the job, at work. You know, in your community, in your family, you've got to be able to see it. You've got to see beyond what you see. It's, it's, it's not about the person that's attacking you. It's who's driving that person to attack me. Do you understand? Makes a difference in your head, does it not? Know your enemy, and the enemy is not who you see. It's the one you don't see. We fight an invisible warfare. Agreed? It's called the angelic conflict. And listen, we start off in this fight as victors. Don't become a victim. When you become a victim, you've surrendered your sword. You're always a, you're always a victor in Christ. Now, don't let anybody take your sword out of your hand. Right? See, that's that Ephesians, put on the full armor of God. Don't let anybody take to listen. He wants your sword. What, you know what the sword is? It's the word of God. He wants the sword out of your hand. That's surrender. Can't beat him on a defense. Can't play defense the whole game. Now, maybe you could, but I don't know. It's, if you find somebody who's good at offense, you might not. Oh, I don't know. Don't want to use too many football illustrations because I can, I'm lost in the scriptures for it. Now, let me close with Revelation. What I find interesting is John picks up Isaiah and Ezekiel. He picks up this idea out of Isaiah. Now, his, his Bible, is I, his, his prophecy, what books is he looking at? He's looking at Isaiah and Ezekiel. That's why I read them first. This is where John's getting his information. He's getting it out of Jeremiah. He's getting it out of the major prophets. He's running the major prophets. He's looking for the coming of Christ. He's separating the first coming from the second coming. Like a good, like a good scholar would do. Isaiah and Ezekiel wrote prophecies regarding Satan's rebellion and the divine judgment of eternity past. John picks this idea up in the prophecy of the book of Revelation. We call that, in theology, we call it eschatology the teachings on the second coming. And so what I want you to do, if you would look at your Bibles, I've just outlined 12 for you briefly so that it, you could get an idea how to look at it. Uh, it's just one of many ideas, but it's mine. In verses 1 and 2, I see I broke them into 1 and 2, 3 through 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Because I think these are important points for us. He begins by talking about great signs. A great sign appeared in heaven. See, he's relating you to the Jewish teachings. His congregation is not necessarily Jewish. It's Christian. We know he opens with the churches and he runs the church all the way through the gamut until he gets to the Jews, back to the Jews again, right? 
it's tribulation. Now we're back into the Jews and the millennium and the end. A great sign appeared in heaven, a wo woman clothed with sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with a child and she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. Notice my points. In verses 1 and 2, the reference is to Satan's attack against Christ, the male child, and the woman is Israel. That woman is not that woman is 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 not Mary. That woman is Israel. Okay? I'm in Revelation 12. That woman is Israel. Look, Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as to as many as received him. Or you could read Romans the ninth chapter through the eleventh chapter, where that was the natural branch, and then we were grafted in as a wild olive branch. <clears throat> so, watch. He's, he, he gives us two signs. He says a great sign that's of two parts. Here's a great sign that has two parts. The child and the woman. The child is Christ and the woman is Israel. <clears throat> yeah. Where's the church? By the time we get to Revelation 12, where's the church? It's been raptured. All right. In chapter 12, verses 3 through 5, let me read that. Then another sign, here's another sign, appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads, ten horns on his head, with seven, di seven diadems. His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might destroy the child, right? We know this is the first coming of Christ, right? Th through this whole episode, right? The whole episode. And listen, he shows the force that he has by in eternity past, he got a third of the fallen angels. They're called fallen now. They got a third of the angels. We don't know how many that was, but he got a third of them to follow him in rebellion. He thought he could overthrow God's government. He, could, he thought he could actually overthrow God. Well, that's interesting. It shows you that. He's, he, he, listen, the Bible calls, listen, you, we read it, but you missed it. He corrupted his wisdom. A corrupted wisdom is what you get here. Boy, be sure your wisdom is not corrupted by thinking you can splice the world into it and come out with something that's going to be good. Yeah, spiritual arrogance is what it is. All right? <clears throat> now, what's interesting, watch, and watch as we read on. Look at verse 5. She gave birth to a son, a male, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. You know, he's going to be the king of kings and lord of lords, right? Watch this now. And her child was caught up, listen, in the thick of trying to... Well, we know this story out of Matthew, too, where he got, he got Herod to kill all the male children under two, right? Well, anyhow, watch... And, but listen, he couldn't get him because her child was caught up to God, to the, third, to the throne. Right? The third heaven. You know what we call that? Ascension. We call that the ascension of Jesus Christ. That's what, Matthew, that's what Acts 1 and 2 talks about. You know, this Jesus who you see going up will come back in the same way, right? Mm -hmm. Good. In Revelation 12, 6, John brings Satan's attack to mid-trib. He does that out of Daniel. Daniel, the ninth chapter, 24 through 27, when Daniel talks about 70 weeks, and then he talks about the seventh week, or we, we call it trib. Well, what John does, what John does, then the woman fled into a wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there's, she would be nourished for 1,260 days. Remember, Jewish, calendar, Jewish calendars has 30, 30 days in a month. 
So you got three and a half years, which is the last three and a half years of the trip. And mere, what John is talking about is mid-triff. Mid-triff. Mid-tribulation. What he's talking about is mid-tribulation. In, in, and so in verse 7, we have the old war in heaven resumed between Michael and his angels fighting Satan and his angels, which is discussed in Jude 9. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war. Now we get to verse 8 and 9. Pay attention to the word, no longer, no longer. Watch that. And there were, and there were, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Talking about the angelic conflict business. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old. Watch this now, this mid-trib. Thrown down, which, which, which is carrying the judgment in eternity past into a point of biblical history. Mid-trib. And the great dragon was thrown down. Now, he's going to explain that. The serpent of old, who is called the devil Satan. These are his names after the fall. Who deceives the whole world. That's his, that's his, we try to get the world saved. He tries to get them deceived. We try to get the world saved. He tries to deceive them. That's the game. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Right? Notice in that place, no longer any place for them in heaven. In mid-trib, listen to me, he's not permitted to ever come back to the third heaven. Now listen to me. Job, I put this down somewhere. Where do, Job, it, it's in 12.10. In a moment, I'm going to read 12.10. In Job 12.10, listen. When Satan's cast out of heaven, he has access in the angelic conflict all the way up to mid-trib to go back to heaven and, and bring charges against the brethren. Well, look, look at verse 10. 12.10. I heard a voice in heaven. Now, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and authority of Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren. See, that's Job 1 to 2. Has been thrown down. He who accused them before God day and night. You see that? He's not permitted to go back. He's not, now he knows he's in deep trouble. Now he knows his time is short. Would you ever see it a minute? He knows it. Okay. God goes, it, it, can't go back. A loud voice. Now salvation. A loud voice in heaven speaking on behalf of the world. Now salvation and power and kingdom of our God and authority of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brother has been thrown down, not accessible back, he can't, he can't come back and accuse the brethren anymore. So that's Job 1 and 2. Verse 11. And they overcame him. Watch this now. This is how you win in the angelic conflict. Watch this. They overcame him, Satan. Watch, there's three because. Because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, Let me give you an example of the word of your testimony. I'm just going to give you a slight, a, a simple one. When you take part in the Eucharist, right, you proclaim his death until he comes. That's one of your testimonies. That's kind of one of those unspoken ones, isn't it? The rest of the time, it's how we live and how we fight in the angelic conflict. And they did not love their life. Here's the third because. And because is the idea. And because they did not love their life even when faced with death. Boy, if you study the, the disciples of Christ, they, yeah, they, they drank the cup. And, and listen, that, we've been so fortunate in America. The church has been on fire. It has, it has been on fire for all these years. And listen, we do not be the generation to have a big loss. We, 
when I first came to Christianity, the church was on fire. You could, you could preach the gospel most anywhere and get people saved. I mean anywhere. You just had, you just had to go do it. Right, Horton? Horton one day, he said, come, out, come, come home and have lunch with me. I'll call my wife, we'll have lunch together. I went, okay. When we got to his house, there was a crew working on the right-of-way in his backyard, in the back of his house. There's all these prisoners. We used, to, we used, to, used to do things like that in Alabama. Make them work for what they ate. He said, eh, we got to get down there and get these people saved. I'm, I'm with you, buddy. He said, well, we got to make a trip first. I went, okay. Never knew with Horton. We went to a local market. A guy sitting on the side of the road, you know, that sells goods. You're in Alabama, don't you know that? Okay. I don't know what they call them, roadside sellers, whatever. We bought watermelon. We filled that, that, that van he had up with watermelons. He said, how many people do you think down there? I said, I don't know, it looked like 20 or something. Well, let's get these watermelons. We're going to take them down there, and if they'll give us permission, but we bought 20, 20 of these without permission. <laughs> what do I know? And we're there, and, they get, and he, he talks to the guard. He said, I want to, can, can we have a break and give these guys a, a watermelon break? I bought all these watermelons for them. And let me give them the gospel. And I want to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to these guys. And the guard goes like, crack one of those open. We crack one open, and he reached in there and got a good, hey, yeah, let's do it. So Horton. Listen, you could preach the gospel. I don't know how many guys got saved, but a bunch of them got saved. A bunch of people got saved just because he, it, that, that's the day I was in. And when I used to read about the rapture of the church, I used to think, you know what? It'll be so obvious of the importance of the church when it's absent from the world. Right? Tim LaHaye wrote this little book, you know, and he had airplanes going and the pilot left and <laughs> passengers left, train, the conductor left, and the engineer left by the rapture. You know, he went through this whole story of that. And, you know, you would go like, wow, everybody in the whole wide world, you know that? I don't believe that anymore. I wish I could. Because I've experienced a church that was once on fire leave a community and they didn't even know we left. We left a community and nobody knew we left. Nobody in the community. The church was empty and they didn't even know it. And we had a good ministry going on, but it wasn't to the community. It was 26 other communities. People from 26 communities drove into us to study the Word of God. And out of it came great ministries. And that disturbed me for about 20 years. And I went, I got to do something. I can't. I can't, I can't do this. So we moved to Moody. And we're having great ministry out in Moody. But I'm not sure it's going to change. I don't know that the people in Moody are any more interested in the study of the Bible than anything. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But I, I'm beginning to suspect that when Christ returns in the rapture, 
there will be many people that don't even know the church is gone. I did not believe that when I first came into Christianity because the church was on fire for God. You could go anywhere in America and you could preach the gospel and people would fall all over themselves to be saved. I went to Pell City in 1968 to do a, th a, a little revival in a church up there in Eden and convinced the pastor and the board of deacons that we would continue preaching the gospel until nobody got saved. If we had a service and nobody got saved, we would shut it down. And we went three weeks and just changed that little city for Christ. We paralyzed it. We had to move out of that little church and we had to go to the armory. And we spent three weeks preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ before the well went dry and absolutely paralyzed it. And the only reason I remember it was 68 is the senior class at Pell City changed their church model from go to church and don't be late. We're the class of 68. It's the only reason I can remember the date when I was there. And it wasn't anything to do with Ron Adam. It was to do with the climate of the time. I hope, that's, I hope we can have another wave of that. I hope we can have another one because they come in waves. I found that out. And my prayer is that we are not through with this deal. It is possible for the church to go in a rapture and nobody even know it in the community. Wouldn't that be a sad situation? And it'll be that way if we don't take serious inviting people to study the Bible with us. They go like, well, it's, it's too much study and it's too much this and it's too much that. Hmm. You should have. Listen, you're lucky I'm here and not Paul. He'd have, pre he'd have preached till the cows come home. Now, he didn't, have, he didn't wear a watch, apparently. In verse 11... They overcame him with the blood of the Lamb because the word of their testimony and because they did not love their life even when faced with death. It was for this reason. Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Listen. He's talking to those in heaven. You know where that is? That's number one on our chart. Right? I'm going to talk about nine changes. That's the first. He says, and that's never changed. It's not going to change, the third heaven. Oh, heaven, and you who dwell in them, woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that, here it is, Horton, knowing that he has only a short time. Only a short time. I love that. Listen, he says, rejoice, O oh heavens. Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Well, that's as far as I can go today. We come back next week. Remember, there's, there's, you know, we looked at the original heaven and earth, and we looked at the new heaven and new earth over here, prophetically. Next time, we'll fill in some of the gaps of some of the, the way the world has revolved and changed. And... Uh, why sometimes unbelievers recognize it and don't understand it, and the church doesn't understand it, don't recognize it. Like climate change. Don't, it? don't understand it. Uh, the unbeliever talks about it all the time. The church never talks about it. Because they don't. But neither of them, the church has just gone silent on it because I think unbelievers talk about it so much, they don't. But... Next time, we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how you can have a conversation with these people intelligently. 
And why? They don't know the source. They don't know why the earth is doing this. They don't know why it's happening. And it's going to happen, and it's going to happen, and gradually it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. You do know that. Next time we're going to talk about the source of these things. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come. It was wonderful to meet the, the Joe Griffin, the Owens, the Joe Griffin's grandkids today. What, what, what a wonderful thing. I remember <laughs> Joe, Don Toole, and Ann, and Pam, and Marion, and some of these people, young and in college. And Joe working on staff there. What a wonderful time that was with some wonderful people. And here we have grandchildren now in college. Just wonderful thing. And I'm fire for the Lord. That's good. Encourage our hearts, Father. Let us not be discouraged by what we see, but what we believe. Let us rejoice. I love that. Rejoice, all of you who dwell in heaven. We should rejoice. We have so much to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. I think Billy was right when he says, stop watching. You're watching way too much news, Dad, because it's all bad. Get back to the Bible and study the good news. I think you're right, Billy. I think you're right. It's depressing to listen to the news. But it is what it is. It's the world in decay. And we are the people that bring a fresh new day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a great verse for us. In Jesus' name, amen.